Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. <laughs> Man, that's what you was doing. You just wanted to go smoke weed with Joe and shit. Y'all I couldn't did keep that. up with Snoop. Oh, Snoop hell. just keeps going. Man, Snoop, <laughs> he got a fucking professional bud roller. I think he's paying 40 grand a year or some shit. Really? I don't know how much, but <laughs> I know it's a dude who eight hours a day, he just bringing, <laughs> he bringing Snoop like, a hundred blunts in a bag. Here you go, Snoop. He's the one dude that's exempt anywhere he goes. No one's going to fuck with Snoop with weed. He smoked weed at the White House. So, I mean, damn, <laughs> Did he really? You know? Yeah, he said he <laughs> went in the bathroom and got down. I said, oh, man. You know, I said, yeah. You know, he he blazed anywhere. You know, church, swimming pools. He inside the pool blazing. Yeah, underwater. He's, he's got a card. You can just let him slide. Yeah. Yeah. He Snoop, you know, what you gonna say? What are you gonna say? What you gonna say, man? Everybody loves Snoop. The same thing with Chappelle. When we go to with, out with Dave, Dave just fire up in a restaurant. <laughs> hey, man, you know. <laughs> Gotta let him know anything. you're in the house. Nobody says anything. Yeah, they what they go. gonna say? Do you, I mean, who wants to be part of his next comedy special? <laughs> the person that told Dave Chappelle, you can't blaze in uh, Ruth Chris. Nah, it's like, yeah, exactly. you know, you know, nah, 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 nah. Well, hey, man, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. You want some coffee? No, nah, thanks for Check having me. Out. You know, I, I probably had too much coffee. All right. Yeah, today, you know what I mean? I probably had about two cups already, so I should be cool till this afternoon. So I saw this video where you you said you're doing just a, a podcast tour. You just yeah. Gonna... I'm going to hit everybody, you know, everybody that want to talk to me. You know what I'm saying? I just want to. Be able to um, get the message out to the people, talk to the people. You know, um, I've been trying to push push my league, and mainstream sports media have really, you know, basically ignored what we're doing for the Why last think that six is? years. I think they're nervous about the NBA. They're nervous about their relationship with the NBA. Could be damaged if they promote the big three i would think it would help everybody yeah i mean it's basketball in the summer you know they got the wnba but we really don't play at the same time you know they got their games we got our games um i and you know what's what's crazy is we got their you know, former Hall of Famers as a part of this league. Um, and they wanted to be a part of this league. So it's not like we hijacking them or we, yeah, you know, kidnapping them. They, they want to be a part of this league. They want it to be successful. And they want to make money in the summer. So I don't know what, what the NBA is thinking about trying to deprive Dr. J and Rick Barry and Iceman, George Gervin, a little – check in the summer what, like what's the problem yeah it doesn't seem like it would compete at all it seems like it would enhance it would make it, it's it, when you have more basketball for basketball i mean basketball fans they have a season and this when it's over it's over yeah the fact that there's more basketball seems to me but i'm a person it's like i feel like there's enough pie for everybody with everything i feel like that with fighting with mma when there's a new organization comes out i'm like yeah. good good give people more opportunity to make money Without a doubt, you know, and it's, it's about who do it the best. And we're not trying to compete in any way, shape, or form with the NBA. Um, we're very complimentary. So I don't understand why they would, you know, do some of the things that's being done behind the scenes. Um, that Oh, they're, like, encouraging people to not do it? Encouraging people to not sponsor us. I mean, like... Really? Yeah, I mean, encouraging... Networks not to play us. Really? Yeah. Um, those things, um, we've been able to survive, but, you know, at a certain point, it's just redundant and ridiculous, and we got to fight back some way, shape, or form. It just, in my mind, it seems silly. It seems like it would only enhance. But that's what happens when you get big corporations, man. Yeah, and, and you know what, Joe? It's not the players. It's not the owners. 
It's not um, GMs or scouts because they, you know, name a big owner. He probably loves the league. And we've heard from a lot of them that they love the league. They would love to invest. Um, and the players love the league. They come to the games. They play in the league when they're done with <laughs> with the NBA. Um, GMs, um, scouts come sit next to me on the front row and be like, oh, man, you know. And they even pull some of our guys, put them in the G League or – a couple of our guys made it all the way back to the NBA, you know, 10-day contracts, things like that. So it's not the culture of the NBA. It's just the suits. It's the corporate Ooh. people. You know what I mean? It's the brass. It's the it's the top guys that are scared of what we got. Just scared of competition in general always. Well, they think they own basketball. They They think, like, we own basketball. Isn't but that but crazy? it's 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 nuts. <laughs> it's fucking nuts because I don't I don't hear kids running out saying, "Mom, I'm about to go play NBA." Right. No, they say, "Mom, I'm about to go play basketball with my friends." Yeah. So basketball doesn't have an owner, and they are, I think, intimidated that we have changed the game. You know, and we haven't changed it just to change it. We've changed it for the better, and we've changed it within our own version of the sport. So we're not trying to change five-on-five. Five. We're just trying to introduce three-on-three three and elevate it to the professional level, which we have. I only think that would be a good thing. Those suits are silly. It is a good thing, man. They it's are silly. A good thing. That's why I'm here, man. You know, it's like it's time for these, you know, suits to get out the way and – you know, let the relationship flourish if it's going to flourish. And even if it don't, look, we're doing fine. We're in our sixth season. Our ratings are growing. You know, we did, you know, 500,000 people on CBS this Sunday. That's awesome. It's crazy. Where did this idea come from? Um, me and my guy, Jeff, you know, we've been working together for over 25 years. Like, everything in the last 25 years – we we kind of been, you know, <clears throat> cooking it up. So, you know, we see Kobe uh, score 60 points in his last game. Now, this idea had been brewing in me, but it was like, you know, um, it's sports. I'm, I'm, I'm an entertainment guy. You know, I'm in rap. I'm in the, you know, music and movies and television and that. So um, it had just been sitting there and, this dude hit 60 points in his last game, and then there's nowhere else you can see him play. Um, he's done. Bye. Wave, go in the tunnel. And we're like, that sucks. It sucks that we cannot ever see Kobe Bryant play in a professional basketball game again. There's got to be other guys that people want to see that um, still got it. They make. They may not be able to play 82 games, you know what I mean? They may not be able to play back-to-backs and three games in four nights, but half-court, three-on-three to 50, they're going to look like all-stars. And mm. so that's where the idea started to germinate. And that makes grow. sense, too, that it's just the breakdown. As you get older, you just can't do as many games. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, they still can play. Like, if if you put them out there one game, give it all you got against the twenty year olds, they'll 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 do great. But if you have them play the next day, you know they just can't recover as fast as the twenty year olds. Yeah. So you, they look like they can't play. You know the next day. Mm -hmm. So by having a week off. You get to recover. It's like football. You know, you get get a chance to let your body recover, heal. So by the time that next weekend come around, you're 100% ready, good to go. Let's do it. Especially with the way guys train today, where older guys can train today, and you know, with the science of sports nutrition and yes, science of recovery, they're just so, so much better. Nors, they're so much better at it now. Maybe than I'm they've getting ever a call from the NBA. <laughs> we changed our mind. <laughs> yeah. We got rid of this. We heard you was on Joe. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> this is so stupid. 
that's the thing with older fighters too they have a hard time getting through camps that's yes. that's part it's like they can still fight but getting through a eight week camp is oof, two a days and all the sparring and, yeah and, too know. much yeah i remember uh I forgot the football player um he played for the giants receiver uh plexico burris <clears throat> plexico burris the coaches hated him because well, I ain't gonna say hated him, you know. I'm just exaggerating, but they didn't like the fact that he would not practice at all, come in the game on Sunday and score a touchdown. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like it goes against everything that they preach. You have to practice. You have to practice. You have to practice. Then you are conditioned to score the touchdown. But he he's like no. I got to recover, I got to recover, I got to recover, and then by Sunday I can go out and score a touchdown. And that goes against coach's yeah. philosophy. But he knew his own body. Of course. Yeah. And, and, and <clears throat> you know, we all know our own body to a certain extent. Yeah. You know, and, and I think you should always save an athlete from himself, but you shouldn't push an athlete before he's ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's always different for different people too. Like some yes. people recover quicker. It's just, you know, as athletes get older, in particular, they get more and more wise to that, more and more wise to like how their body works and what they need to do and not need to do. Yeah, you know the. You know, I heard one player say that, man, they don't pay they don't pay me to play in the game. Like, I'll do that for free. Seventy thousand. 15,000 fans, <laughs> who wouldn't do that for free? They pay me to practice. They pay me to show up on time. They pay me to do all the stuff I don't want to do. And, you know, that makes sense. But sometimes you don't practice somebody just because you're paying them. Yeah. Well, the difference in, like, you can never do this with foot. When football players are done, they're kind of done because the, just the damage they take. Some, you know, I think it, it depends on the style. You know, I think you could do, um, you know, an uh, uh, interesting flag version of football. Um, I think you could sell it if it was, you know, thought about and really worked on to to be, you know, pleasing to the fans. Um how would you do that? Like, what would make? Because people love touchdowns, but they also love tackles. They love people getting hit. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a few ways to do it. You know, you could you could do pads seven on seven, um, and and kind of, you know, open the game up a little bit so it's not so uh, many collisions coming from so many different mm. angles. Yeah, uh, less people. Uh, more space, more skill set, not so brute, but a little bit of hitting. Could do it that way too. Yeah, that could that could work. The flag one, I would think, would be kind of tough. It's tough because people look at flag as as a kind of like a side, you know, a byproduct of football, not real football. Well, almost like football for kids. Yeah, yeah. but they, you know, but. Guys that go out and play two hand touch all day, you know. Yeah. So maybe that's it. Hmm. Who knows? Well, it's interesting when fighters figure out ways to do that too, like what Floyd is doing. What Floyd is doing is so interesting. He retires from fighting and yeah. he says, I'll just start boxing people who have no chance. <laughs> <laughs> hey, why not? You know? I mean, exhibition. <clears throat> like we saw that in yeah. well, what is Rocky Three or something? Yeah. It's like, yeah. yo, I mean he's like he started doing exhibitions with Hulk Hogan and, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and got caught. I mean, he got yeah. hurt, like, you know, dealing with that. So, I mean, I think people want to see Floyd fight. You know, some people want to see him lose. You know, I never wanted to see Floyd lose. And um, so he'll always have some interest, you know, even if he's fighting, you know. What he did is st – it's just complete genius. Yes. First of all, from just changing his style, right? He broke his hands a lot. So mm -hmm. when he was younger, they called him Pretty Boy Floyd. Yeah. And then he changes his name to Money. And when he changes his name to Money, he turns heel. 
Yeah. He, be, he became like this guy talk, and everybody wanted to see him get beat. Yeah. And he's the most unhittable guy in the history of the sport. Yes, sir. He's right up there with Pernell Whitaker. Like, those are the two guys that I say are like the most elusive guys yeah. in, in modern, not, you know, past Willie Pep in yeah. modern era. Pernell Whitaker and Floyd. Floyd's the, even more impressive because he stands right in front of guys. He stands right in front of you and you can't he's hit right him. Right in front of you. And you can't get a good one on him. You can't get shit on it's, him. It's, it's, the amaz- it's the, one of the most amazing skill sets. He's like a, uh, he's like a, you know, one of those like Minnesota Fats kind of pool players that know all the trick shots and yeah, you can't beat him. You know, a guy that can, you know, uh, you know, play a hand or board game or 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 ping pong. Yeah. you just he just know you just can't beat him, and he just he's that way in boxing. Yeah, he just knows all the tricks of the trade. And he's just better. He has way more information about where you should be for we, where he can hit you and where he should be where you can't hit him. It's just he's got it all in his head. He knows what punch can be thrown yep. at what time yep. and what punch can't. And so he just, when he knows you can't throw a punch, that's where he is. Yeah. And when he knows you can, that's where he ain't. My my favorite fight, of, I've had a lot of favorite fights, of his, but one of my favorites was the Canelo fight because it was just a master class. Yeah. Master class and yeah. just... A young, incredibly promising champion, a guy who's going to be an all-time great, but not yet. Not yet. You're not ready and, for that guy. You know, Floyd always catch him young. <laughs> he catch yeah, him coming he catch up. Him young or old. Yeah, like he catch him young. Yeah. Or, yeah, you know. <laughs> he, 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 and he tap you up, and then he say, thank you. Yeah. You know, next. He did a smart thing, too. He got him to cut down 152 pounds. Yeah. He got him a little wow. lighter. Yeah. A little smaller. A little, little more dehydrated. A little weaker. Yeah, a little weaker. And then just box him up. Yeah. But if you see what it did to Canelo's game, like you see Canelo when he fought Danny Jacobs later on, his he was moving like Floyd. Like he mirrored that. You have to. Yeah. I mean, you, you're dealing with a master. Um, and when you fight a master or you, you know, if I rapped against a master or if I, you know, you spar against a master, you better take a few tricks of the trade yeah. with you. You know, that's the whole thing about respecting the game. Daniel Cormier uh, always says uh, you get the rub. Like when someone fights for the title yeah. and you fight a world champion, you feel what that's like. Like, okay. And you either get way better yeah. or you kind of like realize I'll never beat that guy. You'll never get that level. Yeah. yeah. There was like a lot of, like during the Tyson era, nobody got the rub. <laughs> he was like, nah. you got in there and you were like, fuck this. I mean, Tyson had you so many, he had so many psychological advantages. Yeah. You know, everybody else, you know. You know, give me the pretty robe. Put this satin on the robe. I need to, you know, I need to look. Fl- I had to have flares coming from my my tassels. You know, have to be right. You know, I got to look pretty coming in there. Floyd coming in there, gladi- gladiator style. Yeah, towel. Mike, Mike had a towel over his head with a hole in it. And and and, and no, no socks, socks on. <laughs> he, he ain't here for none of that. He just here to whoop your ass. It was and, the best. And, and and you know and. He he psychologically beat a lot of people before he even landed yeah. that fatal punch. Oh yeah, even after the Buster Douglas fight, he, that didn't even take it away from him. A lot of times no. when a guy gets knocked out, like their aura of invincibility goes away. But with Mike, it was still there. Yeah, because people are always scared of the you know when you snap. Nobody want to deal with crazy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Everybody could deal with everything, but. You know, everybody get out the way of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. When Mike was screaming, I'll eat your children. <laughs> Man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is the, the walkout. Look, you're just yeah. pushing everybody, pushing out, of everybody out the way. Nobody even want to give him a dap because they don't know if he going to knock them out on his way <laughs> to the ring. Yeah, that's, I mean, this is some of the g shit ever. Yeah. When you know what I mean? Champ. Like, n- just a towel. Cut the towel in half, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? I ain't got time for this shit. I'm ready to knock somebody the fuck out. It was yeah. a special time in boxing because it was a long time where the heavyweight champion, you know, Larry Holmes didn't get his due because he beat up Muhammad Ali. So everybody yeah. was always mad at Larry. Yeah. And then when Mike Tyson came along, it was like all of a sudden there's like a real heavyweight champion where everybody wants to see him fight. Yeah. You know, um, he was my my first experience of a guy who was just – you know, the Incredible Hulk, like, going and knock people out, you know, two or three rounds, it's over. 
you know, I grew up watching Muhammad Ali and Larry Holmes uh, and all the other fighters in between. You know, I wasn't really, you know, old enough to appreciate Joe Frazier or nothing like that. But um, when Tyson came around, he was like, oh, this is what this is what you want in a fighter. That's why he was a superhero. Yeah. Uh, I was like, this is what you want. You want that attitude, you know. Pretty fighters are okay, but you want you want a ferocious fighter. Yeah, pretty fighters are fun to watch. Floyd's fun. Look, as a person who appreciates what Floyd can do, the the way he expresses himself, it's just a, it's genius. It's genius boxing. When you know a lot of people want to know like who's the best ever, I feel like you go on who got hit the least, who won the most fights, and who got hit the least. If you look at that, Floyd's yeah. at the top of the heap by far. Like no one's even close. Yeah, and count the money. Yeah, <laughs> and count <laughs> like, the money. Yeah, I I gotta say he, you know, he is the best. Um, you know, but when you want to see like a destruction, the Mike Tyson fights were a completely different kind of an event. Yeah, you know the thing is is. You know, I think people would love Floyd if he, you know, had a little more pop on the punch. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he can hit you and get you and pop you and, and, and drop you and, and back you up and do all those good stuff and make you look bad. And and I think, you know, he's, he's just um, people, you know, fault him for not, you know, when he hit it, you know, it, it hurt. Yeah, well, he always had hand problems. I mean, he had yeah. multiple hand yeah. breaks. Yeah, which was very unfortunate. But that also probably contributed to how skillful he was because he couldn't get guys out with one shot. So he had to just always be in the right spot, piece you up, hit and not get hit. Just the way he did it, standing in front of people. It's just, I don't think folks understand how hard that is to do. It's so crazy. Yeah, it's uh, it's almost uh like magic. <laughs> you know, it's almost like magic. You know how. You know, like you're standing there and you're saying, come on, come with your best shot, and you can't get it. You can't land it. How? How? Why? Why can't I land this shot? <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody thinks they can, too. That's what's interesting. Yes. Especially in this whole promo tour he's doing where he's just running around doing these exhibitions. They all think, oh, I could probably land a shot. No. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's 46. Nah. They're talking about him fighting Pacquiao. About them doing it again. I'd watch that. Yeah. I mean, hell yeah. Fuck like, yeah. I don't think I don't think age um should really keep you from checking out somebody you know who's a master. Yeah. Like especially if he's fighting someone his age. Yeah. It's uh it's two masters going at it. Um and you know, Age is, is just a number, you know, it's really just a number. It's not it's not reality. Reality is how you feel. You know, so it's, it's a saying, if you didn't know how old you were, would you know how old you are? Mm. Some people would. It's a, it's an indicator of how well your body's functioning. It's yes. a pretty good indicator though. Like if you said someone uh, wants a fight in their 60, you go 60. Yeah. 60 yeah. too old. Yeah, you know, it's too old to see fast skills. Yeah. But have you have you ever seen an old man fight? It's pretty interesting, oh, yeah. you know. We've been a couple of old dudes. You know what I mean? I've seen on the internet a couple <laughs> old dudes get at it. And it's uh still you know, fun. It's pretty it's fun, you know, one round get down. Yeah. You know, it's like we got the sixty year olds with the one round get down. We're gonna go as long as they can before they fall out. You get fucked up as a sixty year old though, you don't recover. Yeah, you get that's your ass true. kicked as a sixty-year-old, you might be fucked for the rest of your life. Yeah, you're yeah. risking a lot. Yeah, some people would do it though. You know, I've seen some guys that are young that got fucked up that were never the same. Young Man, guys. you know, it's it's um, it's the it's the roughest way to make a dollar in the sports. Roughest. The roughest. Um, and UFC even take it to another notch because. Yeah. You know, somebody can kick your mouth open. Kick your jaw open, yeah. knee you in the face, elbow you in the eye socket. Yeah. yeah, or just, you know what I mean, you know, pull your shit out of socket. Yeah. Yeah, it's like. It's a rough game. It is. It's a rough game, you know. Tap out, baby. Tap out. Yeah. 
it's just but it's the most exciting thing to watch combat sports to me is just like man when you watch like a world title fight there's very few things whether it's boxing or mma like when terence crawford's gonna fight earl spence yeah that fight is going to be crazy yeah man that is a crazy moment it's where you got two undefeated champions in their prime yes and no one knows what's gonna happen you're like i don't know yeah you know it's uh it's interesting you know, sometimes those fights, um, they're just too skilled. You know, have you ever seen mm -hmm. guys just fight? They're too skilled, and they they're just both missing because they can't hit each other because they both yeah. got the skills. You know, so and they don't want to take too many chances and open up. Yeah. yeah. So uh, hopefully it's not one of them. I you know, hopefully it's one of those. Uh, they take it personal from the first couple of rounds and. I, yeah, Keep I can't going. imagine. Terrence Crawford's never been in a boring fight ever. Neither has Earl Spence. I think they're going to go after each other. Well, they know how to tattoo their opponent. So I can imagine them just tattooing each other, you know, back and forth. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see how Terrence, st what stance he uses too. Because he, in my opinion, he's the best switch hitter since Marvin Hagler. Like nobody mm -hmm. switches like Terrence. Yeah. Terrence is just. You're, he's southpaw, then he's orthodox, and it's just as good from both sides. And you gotta like do all this calculating in the middle of the fight and switch it up. Everything's coming from a different angle now. Yeah, your brain is is, yeah. is not moving as fast as it should be. That's such a big. The advantage. body can't move that fast if your brain yeah. is right. You have to think. thinking so much. Yeah, you know? yeah, it should be instincts. But yeah, it's gonna be an amazing fight. And you know, I'm worried a little bit about Earl. You know, he's been in those car accidents. Well, that, that was one. it one? Yeah, was the, one. the Ferrari. Yeah. That's a crazy car yeah, accident, man. dude. He could have died in that 100 yeah. If he didn't have a seatbelt, I mean, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, but if he was wearing a seatbelt, he might be dead. If he was wearing one. Yeah, he got thrown from the Ferrari. Oh, wow. He was in a convertible. Have you seen it? No, I haven't. I've seen the car. Have you seen the, the video? I haven't seen the video. Oh, shit. Watch this. This video is crazy. Here it goes. Wow. Yeah. So he got thrown out of the car, and that's how he survived. I didn't know so look at it was this. like that. Yeah. Jeez. Dude, 100% could have been dead. Yes. 100%. I mean, that was a terrible accident. It's hard to say that you 100% after that. I mean, that. he rolled like five, six, seven times. Look at that car. Just... If if he wasn't a master athlete, could he have survived that? <sighs> and who knows what happened to him when he survived, right? Like, yeah. did he hit his head? Did he hit his neck? Like, what? what is he okay? Like, is he 100%? Or is he always going to be a little, little fuck from that? There's another angle. Wow. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. That's, that's one of the most horrific ones I've seen. But he was okay. Which that's is good. Amazing. Thank God. Amazing. Because, yeah. like, a talent like that, to take that guy at a young age would be so horrible. Yes. Yes, it would, it would be... It would be devastating. They give these dudes money, and they, you could just go buy one of those cars. It's kind of crazy. You could just go buy a 700-horsepower car. You don't even know how to drive. Yeah. <laughs> you just have money. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I used to uh, – it was a trip because I remember being at the studio, Echo Sound one time, and Tupac came. He pulled up in the Benz. It's like, oh, man, Pac, you got your Benz. He's like, yep, I don't have my license, man. I hope I don't wreck it. <laughs> I'm like, damn, man, park that car, man. You don't know how to drive it. He's like, nah, man, I've been in New York, man, for so long. I don't worry about driving. I'm like, oh, you know, I think he did wreck it a few times, you know what I'm saying, before it was all said and done. He's learning how to drive you first know? cars yeah. with Benz. It's Benz, you know, it was like 500. What was the first thing you bought when you started making money? Oh, uh, man, the first thing I bought. Um, like the first car. Oh man, I bought a uh, a Honda Accord. <laughs> I bought a Honda Accord. You know, they had just come out with a new model. It was about it was about twenty G's, and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm sick of rolling around here. And you know, at first I had like a a, a sidekick. You know, a Suzuki sidekick. Oh Suzuki no. made cars. I remember those sidekick. And uh, I was like, man, I need some. I need some luxury. You know what I mean? I'm starting to make money. You know, let's go down here and get this Honda Accord. Me, <laughs> <laughs> Kim. She's my wife, but she was my girlfriend at the time. So we went down there, place on. Uh, I think it was La Cienega. They had a Honda spot, and I just went in there and bought a black Honda Accord. Cash. 
Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty reasonable car. Like, like you didn't go crazy. I only had 20 Gs, so <laughs> <laughs> if I'd have had 40, I'd have bought, you know, probably a BMW, you know what I mean, a 3 Series or something. So, uh, you know, at the time, it was the first cool thing I was able to buy and and not sweat it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, that's the key is to buy it and not sweat it. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're buying it and you're sweating it still, you're like, damn. I remember I remember one day, I remember Dre and Yella, they got checks. I think they got checks for like $35,000. <laughs> Next thing I seen them, they had, both had vets, I think, Corvettes. And I was like, how much you pay? 31. How much you pay for yours? 33. I'm like, y'all broke now. Again. <laughs> <laughs> so what? We look good. <laughs> it's funny, but that's the temptation, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, man, you, you like, you only live once, and we know a lot of people that die young, and so it's kind of like, get it while the getting is good. Yeah, it's also you're young. When you're young, when when I first started making money, my manager thought I had a gambling problem. And he yeah, call, he called me up. He said, uh, "You are you having a gambling problem?" Because he knew how much money I was burning through. Mm-hmm. I go, no, man, I'm eating lobster every ah! night. <laughs> like, I grew up poor. Yeah. I'm like, I'm eating steak and lobster. I'm taking my friends out. I'm like, I'm spending money. Like, yeah, I mean, that's what you do, you know, and it feels good. Yeah, it feels good. It feels good to finally be able to treat and, and um, not, you know, worry about what it's going to look like. Or That's man. the big thing is the worry. I remember the first check I got, I got a check from Disney for a development deal from Disney in, like, 1993. And when I got the check, it was like weight lifted off my shoulders. So it was like, yes. whew. Like I, I could look at my bank account. I go, I got money in the bank account. Yeah. I, have, I could pay the bills. Like, I don't have to think about the bills right now. And it was like like I was lighter. Like Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, it does weigh on you when you can't, you know, when you, when you don't know exactly where the money's going to come from. You yeah. know, the bill's here. You know when you got to pay it, but you really don't know. Exactly how this it's all gonna come together. You know, you you hope the universe bless you with a opportunity. Yeah. And um and so to ha- not have that worry, it is a weight lifted off, you know, and I wish I wish more people could feel the weight lifted off. But there's another thing. The more you make, the more you spend, so Sometimes the weight comes weight. back. <laughs> the weight comes back comes on. Back. You know what I mean? The weight comes back on. And then you have employees, and that's another weight. That's yeah. a different weight. That's like you think about other people's families. And yes. You have to, you're making money for them, too. Yeah. You know, you really, you know, that's why I don't do nothing crazy. You know, I'm not in the skydiving, <laughs> nothing like that. You know, I'm definitely not going down in no damn submarine to look yeah, for what no the fuck? Titanic. I don't do, I don't take those crazy chances because, you know, I got generations depending on me. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, um, got to take that responsibility serious because you never know when others in my family bloodline or whatever are going to be able to have the opportunities that I have, you know. Even though my son... O'Shea Jr., you know, he's working constantly. He's in Spain right now. Yeah, he is. That's, yeah. Ama- that's amazing that he's he's just carrying on. That's beautiful. It is, That must be, make you very proud. Man, it's like the best. One, one guy asked me, you know, how does it feel seeing your, your son, you know, straight out of Compton and, and on the, does so well? I said, it's like, it's like winning the Super Bowl on a team – and then your son comes and wins the Super Bowl for that same team. Mm. <laughs> that's the feeling. I don't know if anybody has ever had that feeling, but it seems like that's how I feel. It's like I won with NWA, and he won with NWA. That's amazing. That's am- and what a perfect person to play. I mean, how, how who, who would be better to play you? It's exactly. Perfect. It's perfect. I mean, I, before he, you know, decided to take the movie, I, you know, I would take him on tour with me and we would do 
we was doing that anyway. He would jump on stage. He would do Dope Man. And, you know, I'm like, yo, this is my son, you know. And um, I'm like, man, he he got that swagger up here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Mind me of a young me. Okay. So when it was time to do the movie, when it was really a go, I went to him and I said, uh, hey, man, this, this NWA movie look like it's going to go. Um, he was like, cool, man. That's good. Good luck, man. That's great. I'm like, hold on. Hold on. I said, uh, I want you to play me. He was like, okay. And I'm like, oh, that was too easy. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was like, you know, that was, he was like, okay. And he just kept on walking. I'm like, wait a minute. And then I said, I got to see if he's serious uh, or he's just, you know, saying okay, just to say okay, but it's, it's a hell of a lot of work. So I um I start putting him through the through the ringer a little bit. You know, I was like, Hey man, we got an acting we got an acting coach for you. You know, LA you need to go down there on Thursday, you know, you need to be there at this time and that boom, boom, boom. It's like, oh all right, all right. And he would go. And I'm like, okay, he's starting to go. But is he just going? Is he participating? Is he into it? You know, boom. So I said, I'm going to try something else. I sent him to New York to to a guy uh, for, for you know, training, acting. I'm like, I'm going to send him all the way to New York and see if he'll do that. Because that's when he'll bail. Be like, oh, I don't, you know, I got something to do. So he, he got on the plane, flew to New York, worked with this mm. cat. Flew back. Now, when he flew back, I I was checking him out, seeing what he was doing. You know, we was far from actually casting a movie at that time. And then he was like, uh, he came up. He was like, I'm going to go work with my coach today. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, me and my acting coach, we're going to get together. We're going to do a couple of things. So I'm like, he's into it. He's into it. Yeah. So then I... Let him do that. So now I have to approach Gary Gray. Now, Gary Gray is the director of Straight Outta Compton. He also directed Friday, and he directed uh, It Was a Good Day. You know, these are some of my biggest projects. And when I told him, he was like, yeah, man, it's cool. You know, he was thinking about who we going to get to play him. I said, okay, guess who I want to play Ice Cube? He's like, who, who, who? I said, my son. He was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Cute. Uh, I said, what the fuck, man? I thought we was making a real movie, man. I said, <laughs> <laughs> we are making a real movie. What you talking about? I said, he's going to be great in it. He's going to be great. If you get the part, I'll, he'll have to audition and Universal will sign off on him. But you're going to work with him. Just like John Singleton worked with me. You know what I mean? John put me in Boys in the Hood. I didn't act. I wasn't no actor. I was just a rapper. And um, he saw something in me, put me in the movie, and he helped me through it. And the rest is history. And you're going to do the same thing. And he was like, wow. So, make a long story short. It's audition time. Screen test time. Now, my son going there. And he said he got pissed off because there's five other fucking ice cubes there to audition. <laughs> He's like, these dudes think they're about to take this. He said, man, I felt like I had the family name on my back. I had to go in there and house this shit. And he said, you know, when he left the, 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 the screen test, Donna Langley from Universal called me. And it was like, your son was great. He was actually the best one. And we're going to sign off on it. Wow. Yeah. It's cool. Cool story. That's a great story. It's a great story the way you made him do it, too. That's so smart. He worked harder than any of the other actors. Like, two years of grinding. Because, you know, the coach's son always, he get it the worst. Right. You know what of I mean? Of course. Yeah. He, and, and. It was no different on this movie. You of know? course. He had to, I had to make sure that he won and he set up himself for a, a career in this game. That's amazing. That's amazing. Your career, like 
it, it, what's one of the things that's so fascinating about your career is like there was never anyone like you before that did what you did. You went from gangster rap to like family movies. Yeah. Like yeah. no one's ever done that. And then nah. sports entertainment. Like you, you've branched out into so many things, but the, the key part of it that people need to understand today is when you guys came out, when NWA came out, the whole world went, what the fuck? Yes. The whole world. I remember I was on, I was in Revere, Massachusetts. I was on an elliptical <laughs> machine at the gym. Mm. And a friend of mine told me, you got to listen to this shit. And I had a, a cassette Walkman. Yeah. So I'm there with a cassette Walkman on an elliptical, sh- elliptical machine, listening to Straight Outta Compton, going, holy shit. Like, this is why. There was nothing like that before that. And I remember, like, laughing while, while I was riding the elliptical. I'm like, these yeah. guys are out of their fucking minds. <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. crazy. And... Then there was like the Tipper Gore shit where yes. Al Gore's wife was trying to censor rap music. The, the PMRC, mm. Parents Resources Mu- Against Music Council or something like that. Ugh. And um, That was the Democrats, folks. That That's the reason you have an advisory sticker on the record because that was the compromise. They were saying, you know, I sent my, <laughs> sent my daughter – to the record store to buy a record. She came home with the fucking two live crew. <laughs> I know this shit was going to be like this. <laughs> you know, so, you know, the compromise from the the record industry was we'll put a parental advisory sticker on the record. to So if a parent was buying a record for Christmas, you know, they – parents was like i want too short you know what i mean they go buy the too short record put it in and they're like what the, f- the hell so we were the first group to put that sticker on our records we were the very first group because wow. priority records designed that parental advisory sticker and uh yep that there sticker it and it was it was actually, it had to be stuck on the record, like a sticker. And they had to go through all our records in every record store and put the sticker on. So the next time we did artwork, we just planted it in the artwork. Wow. And then kids wouldn't buy your shit if it didn't have the sticker. <laughs> It's like people was putting a putting a sticker on clean records. That's you know? hilarious. It's like a clean record, not one ounce of profanity on it, but they was putting the parental advisory because kids was looking at it. It was like, "Where's the sticker with no?" St- ah, this. that's yeah. hilarious. The opposite effect. It promotes it. Yes, that's what exactly what happened. It promoted it. Two Live Crew was the first band that got arrested, though, right? Weren't they the first band that got arrested? Um. On stage, I believe. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. You know, his rap got a long history. You know, I don't know if somebody, you know, tackled, you know, Cool Herc or somebody. Right, one day. right. But, but uh, that's the one that went, you know, nationwide news. Um, and, yeah, he got arrested. Yeah. Yeah, Luke, Luke fought for all of our freedom of speech, to be honest. You know, if they would have took Luke down and the two live crew at the time and said that this music is too obscene and you can't sell stuff like this, you know, everything would probably be so, you know, sterile right now, you know. Yeah, oh, for sure. It, it, well, that's the same thing with Howard Stern and radio. Yes. You know, they went after Howard. They, they, they fined them insane amounts of money for the Howard Stern show. Yes, and I remember. He, and if he just folded... And gave in to that. There'd probably be no podcasts, or it would have taken a lot longer for exactly. people to figure this out. Yeah, um, it's incredible. It's incredible when when you stand up at the moment of truth. You know. Yeah. Like it's important for us to stand up when, at the time that is going on, and not back down and then try to regroup and yeah, and then go at it you know it's it's really important it is for people to stand up for themselves but it's it's hard yes it's it's hard today more than ever because you get so much pressure people like especially during covid 
people ganged up on people. People were doing the man's work for the man. It's like, yeah. wh- who the fuck are you trusting? Like, why yeah. are you trusting these people that have been lying forever? Yeah, man. It, it, it was wild during that time. Like, it, it you know, people um, being bullied into doing things that they didn't want to do. A lot of them didn't want to do it. They they did it because of their work or their yeah, you know their um, and a lot situations of or yeah, a lot of them are, are hurting right now. You know, yeah. I know, you know, I know um, a guy that's you know been dealing with tinnitus since since he got it, and so I know, you know a lot it's, of it's people just, that got yeah, fucked up. Yeah. I know quite a few people that got fucked up. Some of them pretty bad. It's just, it, it was just, there was, it, if you wanted to do it in a textbook way, like if it was a conspiracy, that's how I would do it. I'd isolate people, make them stay at home, take away their livelihood, make them scared, give them small checks, you know, get, and then give them this thing that you got to take to get back to normal. Want to get back to normal? Yeah. Go take that. Don't <laughs> worry. It's safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. And then you have all this pressure and everyone is yelling at you if you don't do it. If you don't do it. We're not going to get back to normal. And everybody got scared, and everybody just f- stepped in line. And it was strange. It's strange. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, stepping in line sometimes is not the way to go. No, it's not always the way it's, to go. It's, you know, you're trying to prevent and trying to make things all smooth and easy and no issues and and back to normal and all that and the world might be back to normal but are you right normal well you got to be able to make informed decisions yes and when you can't make an informed decision and you're being pressured anyway it's like what what do you how long and it, this is the thing that was driving me crazy before the election all when donald trump was president all they were talking about is i'm not going to take the shot you're going to take a shot that trump made Who's going to take that shot? Even Biden was saying it. Mm -hmm. Who's going to take it? Kamala Harris is saying it. They were all saying it. Don't take that. I would never take that. And then all of a sudden Biden becomes president. And they're like, you got to take it. Like, is this the same thing? This is the same thing. You know how long (laughs) it takes to develop a vaccine? This is the same vaccine. Same one. You guys were just talking shit. And, you know, no matter who tried to give it to you at the end of the day, it wasn't ready. It's not ready. You know, six months to try to turn this thing into something effective um, that was totally, you know. uh, Experimental. Totally experimental. um, And everybody who who took it was was basically signing up to take an experimental drug. Um, And I'm not anti-vax. I've been vaxxed before. Like, I've had vaccines. how about all of them? And, Everyone I was yeah, supposed to get. Exactly. Uh, but those have been, some been around 80 years, some been around yeah. 50, 40. Um, and I just wasn't comfortable after six months. I was ready to take it. The UFC allocated 150 vaccines, I think, for all their employees. And this was when we were doing shows during the lockdowns. Yeah. So we'd go, there was a COVID bubble, you'd get tested, you get tested the day of the event. And I was there, and they said, oh, we got the vaccines. You want to take it? I said, yeah. So I, I, I called up the doctor. I said, hey, man, can I take it? And they, and they said, yeah, hold on. We'll, we'll set it up. I was going to take it, like, before the show. Mm-hmm. I thought it was just like a flu shot. Give yeah. me that thing. It's normal, right? And they call me up, and they say, no, we can't do it until Monday. Uh, we have to, it has to be done at the clinic. Can you, can you go on Monday? I said, I can't. I go, but I'll be back for another event in two weeks. Mm-hmm. Said, okay, we'll do it then. And during that time, it got pulled. During the time, it got pulled for blood clots, and two guys I knew had strokes. Wow. Two guys I knew. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then I was like, okay, what is going on? And then my friend got it and got over it quick. And I was like, what's going on? My real estate lady had it, and she didn't even have any symptoms. She tested positive twice. And she's like, well, I got to isolate, but I feel fine. And then I was like, well, what is this? Is this a death sentence, or is this like, how many people are asymptomatic? Mm-hmm. And you find out like 65% of the people are asymptomatic. Like, what, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. And then uh, I knew some people that got it and got real, real sick, but they were fat or they were out of shape or they, were, they had other problems. And then I knew a few friends who were real healthy that got it. They got wrecked because they didn't take it seriously and they kept working out. So there was a lot of confusion. Yes. 
and uh, you know it was a lot of, a lot of fear but when i finally got it and i got over quick and then they started attacking me for taking horse medication i was like what the fuck is going on shouldn't you be more interested in the fact that this deadly disease hit this 55 year old dude and he was better in three days isn't that more interesting like why don't you ask what i took yeah. like why did i get better what is it yeah i wasn't vaccinated yeah i wasn't vaccinated but i i got over it quick so what's wrong with that in any other fucking rational sane world when there's a disease and someone goes to a doctor and gets medication for that disease and gets better in three days you go oh well that's a way to get better from that disease yes. it's not that this is one singular thing that you have to do that i can't even do now because i already have antibodies like this is stupid it's crazy and you know the thing is is <clears throat> when money is the driving force and you know i, I don't know if they can even get money off of what you took you know what I mean? No. Uh, it seems like something that's been around for a long time. That's just and, one of the things I took. And 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 there's no money in it. Right. No, no new money in it. Yeah, so, zero money in it. So that's really what it's all about. You know, it's not about if it worked or if it's effective. It's about they can't make no money off yeah. of it. And we got this new stuff that we can make billions. So that's where the pressure comes from and that's why they pushing it that's why you have to think for yourself because money is driving these people to um give you bad advice or give you the wrong advice or or to hide um you know solutions and cures and remedies uh from you and and um you know you got to once once you peep that out, you have to st take a step back and make sure that you're you're following the money to make sure it's not. Uh, it's just so hard take to you do down. in the yeah. middle of a pandemic. That's why it was so hard because everybody was just like locked in their house and scared, especially in California. The, the attitude in California was so much different than the attitude here. We came to Texas. I'm like, don't I have some fucking mask on? This is crazy. Yeah. They were just out normal. Yeah, Cali, they went crazy with it, you know. I was using the mask really to, as a disguise. So like, I could finally walk, <laughs> finally walk through here, and nobody <laughs> asked for a selfie. You know what I mean? Cool. <laughs> so, you know, I, I kind of like I got the mask in my pocket for that too. You know, what I mean, pop it on up to the airport. And it's just a disguise now. Yeah. The, well, finally, you can wear a mask. Yeah. Any other time, and <laughs> that's what I tripped off too. I was like, they letting all these people stand around. In these stores, walking through these stores with their face covered. You yeah. Know, we, we, and we, banks. We, yeah, when is, yeah, exactly. When is a guy just going to pull out a pistol? And they were like, I don't know. They all had masks. We don't know who it was. It was, it was a mask. Who's that mask man? Well, it's happening so often in New York City. They made people take their masks down when they went into stores. They made that a rule so that the camera can get a shot of your face. Lord. It's so stupid. Like, yeah. It's so stupid. <laughs> I'm supposed to keep this on to protect everybody. Well, and then they they found out real early that it didn't even work. They knew yeah. early that those things were bullshit. But it was a it was a thing that they get you to comply with. Yeah, and it's also you did it so you didn't feel like an asshole. If everybody had a mask on, you didn't. You felt like an asshole. It's like ah, oh, put a mask on. Yeah, and, and you know people were looking at you like you're the one spreading all the COVID around here. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was crazy. <laughs> um, I I knew a guy got sick wearing the mask, like. He had this cloth mask that he just felt it was the thing that was going to protect him. I'm like, dude, you're breathing in and, like, wash that thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You breathing that. You, I don't know what you breathe. You breathing Bacteria. in last week's, you know. Bad breath. <laughs> yeah, fat burger. <laughs> like, dude, you know what I'm saying? Take that off your face. Yeah, you wouldn't want that on a wound. No. Right? No. You know, a dirty-ass rag over a cut. Yeah, and you're like, breathing through it all yeah. day, every day. Getting right into your bloodstream. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're smoking weed through that thing, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Take it off. Yeah, it it was just weird. This is a weird time. I, I saw that you would, you'd you have to pass on a movie because they wanted you to get a shot. Yeah. You know, they, uh, strangest thing, you know, say we're doing a movie, we're doing a movie. Um, I'm like, okay. And then, um, all the producers in Hollywood decided that <clears throat> they don't want anybody on there 
movie set that haven't gotten a vaccine. And what year was this? This is 2020. Okay, so it's in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're coming out of it. Um, I think it might be 21 when we know, okay, everything is going back to normal. But it the, the, the I, I believe the news came out um, during 2020. And so, you know, I never thought it was a producer's mandate. You know, I thought it was a studio mandate. But I think the studios really wanted to have, you know, kind of a little out. So they put it on a producer. Like, this is not us. This is mm-hmm. this production, that production, this production, that production. I'm like, but it, it's every production. So you mean to tell me every producer in Hollywood has this mandate? Give me a break. <laughs> it has to come from the studio to hit every producer because every producer don't think the same. Like, right. every some producers, you know, um, had their own different opinions. So anyway, it was a studio mandate. They put it on individual producers. So producers talking to my people, and they're like, if he don't take it, you know, we, we, he can't be in the movie. It's like, it's not taking it. It's not taking it. It's like, okay, he can't do the movie. Okay, no problem. Now, I didn't go out telling everybody what happened. I didn't um, um, put the word out that I didn't even tell people that I – wasn't vaccinated. I didn't tell people not to go get vaccinated. I didn't tell people that I'm not doing this movie because I don't want to be vaccinated. Uh, but somehow, some way, the news hit the, you know, I don't know if Hollywood Reporter or somebody put it out that this is why Cube is not doing the movie. And I thought it was chicken shit. I thought it was, you know, um, it's like what happened to the HIPAA laws? You know, or OSHA, one of them, <laughs> I forgot, I think it's hip. you know, where you're not supposed to to reveal a person's medical status. And here it is, they print in mine. Um, and so I just thought it was bullshit. And, um, and it just kind of snowballed, you know. I'm like, what they want is for people to tell me I'm stupid. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Exactly. They want people to tell me. You turn it nine you turn it down nine million dollars, you stupid. You know, I'll do anything for nine million dollars. How stupid can Q be? Um, and I don't care about that. You know, it's like I didn't lose nine million dollars because I never had it. Like if you never have some shit, you don't, you can't lose it. Okay? You lose it when it's in your bank account, then you look up and it's gone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But <laughs> if you never had it, I didn't lose it. It just was never given to me. And so, you know, they they try to, you know, put my business in the street, put pressure on me, everybody around me telling me how stupid I am so I can go get vaxxed and say, you know, please let me do the movie. You know, that was never going to happen. I don't care if it was $20 million. Um, That was never going to happen. And if you got injured from that vaccine, you would have paid that $20 million to be healthy again. Damn right. Damn right. Yeah. Damn right. There's a lot of people out there that wish they they weren't forced into making that decision. And that's where the real lawsuits are going to come from. The real lawsuits, since you can't sue the vaccine companies, they're going to start suing these businesses. And they're already lining up. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. It was a gigantic error. And and they're, <clears throat> you know, they they fired a lot of people. You know, I think they fired a lot of, um, they fired a cops, lot of cops in New York. Yeah. And they had to hire them back. And give them back pay. And give them back pay. But what about the ones that were injured that took the vax? Yeah. You know, they got to have some kind of a repercussion because, yeah. you know, they they just proved that they just kind of told on themselves that we got this wrong. Yeah. And nobody and wants to talk about it. That's the crazy thing because all the news Nobody stores, can. Yeah. Hey, you know, that's exactly. what I'm talking about, the, the gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Nobody can talk about it because- Somebody above them told them no. Um, from this outlet, that outlet, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, the NBA. And going back to that, you know, I'm I'm just kind of putting it in perspective. But the guys in the NBA used to talk about the big three. If you go back to year one, all the time, and then they just stop. And then I ask, you know, I ask my guy, 
you know, uh, what happened, man? Why y'all stopped? They told us we couldn't oh. mention the big three anymore on air. Mm. So I'm like, that's chicken shit. You know, that's that that's that bullshit that I'm talking about. That, yeah. that you know, I'm talking about what happened to me, but it obviously happens everywhere to all of us. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. and we got to somehow, some way, get these people out of our way or um, not support what they're doing and producing. Um, you know, some of these mainstream outlets are really just an extension of these corporate conglomerates who want to, you know, kind of, control our emotions control our movement control our spinning control our personalities control our mind um and you know what we gonna do about it like at the end of the day you know what i'm saying like we're gonna just sit here and let it happen day after day till we're steamrolled and 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 um, wore out and have no fight in us? Or are we gonna stand up where we can? You know what I mean? And push back when we can. I know everybody can't in all situations and don't feel bad when you can't. But when you can and you know you can, do it. Yes. Do it. Like when you have the leverage, take it. Yeah. Yeah. Take it like like UFC. When you got the leverage, you gotta go. Yeah, use that yeah. to your advantage. You might not always have the leverage. You might not always have, you know, the right uh, timing. But when you do, when you can, we we gotta we gotta buck buck back. You know, um, if not, we are just gonna continue to get steamrolled and not be heard and canceled and all this kind of stupid stuff yeah we're just repeating patterns that have played out throughout history yes when people get power they want to have ultimate power they want more power the any obstructions they see to their goals any things that people were doing that would get in the way they want to silence that stop that they want to bust unions they want to do whatever the fuck they can to consolidate their power yeah and it's uh at a certain point it's just ridiculous yeah and um, it was not good for these us. are some of the most unhappy people in the world who is just concerned with more and more power and they're powerful. You know, when have you saw a guy who was maxing out, you know, bench pressing or whatever and blew out a shoulder like a bunch of times? Like, it's like you was maxed out. The last time you maxed out, why are you trying to max out even more and more and more and more and then you blow out your shoulder? You see what I'm saying? So at a certain point, you got to know when you got enough of this and enough of that. <clears throat> I think the money people, though, they never think that way because it's all about numbers. Like the whole thing is numbers. It's not like, look, I put out a new album. Look, I put out a new movie. I'm, I'm creating a thing. I'm putting together stuff. For them, it's always numbers. It's all numbers. It's just numbers. And so you never feel satisfied. And there's always a guy with a bigger jet. There's always a guy with a bigger house. There's always a guy with more of this, more of that. And yeah. Yeah. And usually, you know, you can find happier people with way, 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 way less. Way less. <laughs> yes. Way less. Yeah. If your goal is happy, that is not the occupation you should be in. That's not. No. Yeah. Those people are miserable. Yeah. And they're always chasing. And they're never satisfied. You know, that to me is torture in itself. Well, it's also stupid. And if and if you're running a corporation, it's actually your obligation. Your obligation to your shareholders is to continue to make as much money as possible. So you're trapped in a system that obligates you to behave and think that way. And if you don't, you won't be competitive. Yeah. It's a, it's an ugly game, you know. And, and I don't see where, where people are being thought about in these type situations, you know. It's no. all about, you know, capital don't care. Yeah. Capital has no emotions. Capital only respects capital. 
Yeah, the only time it respects people's opinions is when people boycott shit and it works, like this Bud Light thing. Yeah. Then and now people are like, don't do that again. Yeah. Like, be careful, because look what yeah. happened to Bud Light. Well, who controls Bud Light? That's the question. Why would they make a dumb decision like that? Are they trying to ruin Bud Light? And why would they want to ruin Bud Light? Are they trying to take down some of our most iconic American brands? And why would that help? I don't think them? they were trying to. I don't think they had any idea this was going to happen. It's this uh, ESG thing that everybody has to dedicate a certain amount of their time to, you know, woke stuff. Who who man who mandates that? It's a good question. Where does the ESG money come from? Is that uh, government? Like, where does that come from? And it's they they have scores, and the the ESG score of your corporation determines what you get. And the problem is also you get these people that are coming out of college, like this this lady who made the decision for Bud Light. You know, she's gone through the university system, she's in the corporate system, and she's a woman, and she thinks, you know, we have to be more inclusive, and that's all the language everyone's using today. Yeah. And so they don't know any real people. They don't know regular people. They mm -hmm. have no idea that if you take a brand, Bud Light, which is, like, known for, you know, blue-collar drinking people, that yeah. they, they like to fucking watch football and drink Bud Light, and then all of a sudden you have this mentally ill person who's just an attention whore and you make a big <laughs> deal out of putting this person 365 days of womanhood you put that on a bud light can and they freak the fuck out yeah and then kid rock shoots a bunch of them and then it's on once kid rock shoots your cans you got real problems yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty sure you do uh yeah man it's kind of like i think you gotta you gotta still ask why like what you think what? there's like a, a conspiracy well, you know, who's getting hurt? Who's getting hurt in this whole thing? Is it the Bud Light? Um, Anheuser-Busch? Brass? Are, are they, are, will their bonuses be affected? Will their checks and salaries be affected? You got this lower-level person fired, and a bunch of middle-class guys are paying the price because— you got distribution centers, you know, mm -hmm. the guys that deliver the beer nobody want, and now they're out of a job. Now you're really attacking the middle class mm. um, by by making a brand that's so big um, take a hit like that. You it know, says, um, yeah, the quickest destruction of a company in history. Bud Light sponsors Toronto Pride Parade. <laughs> so, you know, it's... Um, Oh, there's a, when was this? That was just the other day? Yeah. Oh, they're so silly. <laughs> they're leaning into it. Like, but why meanwhile, would you... the gays are mad at them. The, the pride people are mad at them because they didn't support Dylan Mulvaney. So they, 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 they like kicked it <laughs> they out don't of gay win. bars. You don't win you know, either way yeah. at the end of the day. But, um, you know, I, I think about the companies that own these companies, the people that own these companies, and why would they let a decision like that take the company down i don't think they thought it was going to i think this is a legitimate public outrage one where they just pushed too far and people went fuck you and it wasn't even like a real like promotion it was a thing they sent a can to this person this dylan mulvaney person but i don't think it went anywhere else i think it was just like here this is for you and you put it on social media they made some sort of a partnering deal mm -hmm. you know and that was it so why target do the same thing well, I think that's an ESG thing. That's an ESG thing, right? And Target lost billions of dollars, too. Because people, people are sick of this shit. They're sick of social things like that that are controversial getting stuffed into your face and where you have to accept it. Yeah. And people are like, I don't want to accept it. It's just like, I'm just coming here for fucking toilet paper. Yeah, I think, you know, people got to keep it in perspective as well, too. You know, I don't think people grab a beer to be so... I mean, the the... To you know, to learn about the newest social event right. or the social situation going on. Right. Grab a beer because you want a beer. Hang with your buddies or hang, you know, yeah. with people that enjoy beer and y'all shoot the shit. And politics really shouldn't be in somebody's <laughs> beer mug. You know, they just don't get it. They think it has to be in everything. Everybody, because of social media, everybody feels like they're fighting some sort of social battle with everything they do. And yeah. you know, and this is one. 
this is another one. It's like it's like forced compliance. You have to you're forced to comply with this. And you know, it's fucking up women's sports in a huge way, in a huge way. And you know, some organizations are, are pushing back against that and some people are pushing back against the organizations that are pushing back against it, which to me is insane. Like if you care at all about biological women, you should be against that. Without it, I mean, what if like LeBron said he wanted to play in the WNBA? <laughs> like, I'm retiring from the NBA because I'm 49 and I'm going to play in the WNBA. Well, they wouldn't be able to stop it if he just decided to say publicly, I identify as a woman. What are they going to do? They can't do anything. And then that would be the end. <laughs> that would be Dave Chappelle is a bit about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> LeBron it's, scores 100 again tonight. Well, there was some fucking knucklehead that was getting an interview. They said if Mike Tyson identified as a woman, should he be able to fight women? And they were like, well, the short answer is yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> Lord. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah. It's okay. So, and there's also different specifications. It's like what you have to do and how long you have to take hormones before you can identify as a woman and compete as a woman. Like, just fucking stop. I mean, who's going to check all that? Yeah. There's a reason why there's women's sports. And yes. there's a reason why there's men's sports. And it's you're not talking about who who you are or what your truth is. Live your truth. I mean, Title IX just got, you know, was just turned, what, 30 or yeah. something like that. You know what I mean? So Protecting women's sports. Yeah. Yeah, and, which, is, which is great because it forces schools and, you know, that make a lot of money. You know, I mean, teaching whatever they teach in them schools, and they should carve out some for women to be able to play for their school. You know, that's great. And um, so I don't understand. You know, sometimes things don't make crazy man sense, and when they when they don't make crazy man sense, I just back out. <laughs> 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 I just stop thinking about it. Yeah, it's probably a good move because yeah. you're not going to solve it. No. I mean, if people are, I think ultimately it gets solved where people just don't accept it anymore. And then hopefully it'll go. I mean, maybe they could just develop a transgender league where trans people play against yeah. trans people. That would be great. Why not? But you can't pretend you're a biological female just because you wish you were. Like, you can't pretend when it comes to women's sports. You can't pretend when it comes to women's rights issues. It's like, like that's not. This, 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 you don't want men dominating that because that's what it yeah. is. It's men entering to women's spaces. Yeah. And whether they're ultimately they identify as a woman, that's great. But you physically, you're a biological and, male. And, yeah, yeah. And you want to compete against them? You want to play rugby against women? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. That's well, crazy. No, they want to dominate. They want to dominate. There's a lot of that. They want to dominate. They want to be winners. Yeah. Yeah. If all of a sudden you give me a woman and a winner and just fucking kick everybody's ass. Yeah. You know how you used to, like, play the kids in basketball? Like, they ate. You know, mm -hmm. Shaq out there. <laughs> 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 you just Shaq. Yeah. And like <laughs> It's the ultimate sandbagging, you know? It's like, you know you have a giant advantage. Like, the, the one that drove me the craziest was the MMA fighter. Yeah. Because that person became a woman for two years and then started competing as women. And not telling them and saying it was a medical issue. It's, I don't have to disclose a medical condition. Like, no, 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 no. That's not what that is. Wow. Like, if, you, if they, if that person said that they were a woman and and competed against women, that's deception. That's a fucking lie. But if you said you're a biological male and the women still want to fight you, okay, all good. Yeah, you know, um, it's tricky, man. It's like a slippery slope. Yeah, you know, that really starts to get bizarre after a while you know because where does it where does it um actually end at the end of the day you know like, yeah what if somebody say i don't i don't identify as black i want to be another color yeah purple i'm purple <laughs> <laughs> what you laughing at me you can get purple you laughing at me cancel your ass you laughing at me because i'm purple yeah, <laughs> that's basically yeah. Well, we you know you might as well you know I'm I'm a I'm a chicken dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm macaroni and cheese. I'm rice. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm the rolls. Yeah, you know I'm I'm a, I'm a chicken dinner man. 
kids yeah. or identify as. There's people identify as younger people. It's, it's like the whole, it is a slippery slope. Yeah, because yeah. people can, you know, people always can be extreme with stuff like that. They're extreme with that, and they keep pushing boundaries. And they're pushing boundaries on uh, age of consent now, which is crazy. You know, there's um, there's people that are also pushing back against p calling people pedophiles. And nah. saying you should call them minor attracted persons. Man, come on. It's insane. I mean, you're getting yeah. academics that are saying this. It's this, insane. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's borderline madness. So I'm, we're almost there. Yeah, well, it's the end of an empire. Yes. And, you know, there's this guy, Douglas Murray. He's this English, uh, British intellectual. And he said that every time uh, a civilization is close to collapsing, they become obsessed with gender. It happened with the ancient Greeks, with the Romans. It's just mm -hmm. like some weird thing that happens when everything is just going too good and life is too easy. People get obsessed with the weirdest things. And now we're obsessed with gender. Wow. Well, it's the beginning of the stay end. Stay tuned. Yeah, who knows? I mean, maybe we'll bounce back. You know? Get a good president in there, you know? Turn it around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think I, don't, so? I don't put a lot on the president. <laughs> Not this I don't one. put a lot on the president. Well, for sure. I wonder what would happen if Robert Kennedy Jr. got in there. Very interested to see what happens with that guy. Yeah, you know he's, uh, you know he's he seemed like a guy who, at least, is down to deep dive. Yeah, and talk real and and you know, really try to dissect what's really going on instead of just going with the herd, um, which would be easy for him to do, like go yeah. with the herd, you know. He may be, you know, even ahead more, in the, um, or he may even be doing better, you know, when, when they poll, I think he's like 20% of the people or something. But yeah, he'd probably be doing better. Probably be doing better, and, you know, instead of, you know, maybe he'll be one of they one of they guys, and so by him going this route, it's uh, seems like he's on a more noble route, and we just check him out and see how he navigates some of this stuff. Well, he's definitely on a more noble route, and it's definitely not something he planned to do initially. I mean, he was an environmental attorney. Yeah. He was the guy that cleaned up the Hudson River. They would go after these corporations that were dumping toxic waste. And and that was his thing. It was like mm -hmm. mercury in the water and, 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 you know, trying to hold the corporations accountable. And then these women started showing up every time he would speech, give these speeches. And they said, we want you to look into mercury and vaccines. Yeah. And so this is 18 years ago. And so yeah. for 18 years, this guy's been saying, all this stuff about environmental concerns. And that was what his whole thing was. And then mm -hmm. it wasn't until COVID came along. And then he wrote that book, The Real Anthony Fauci, detailing, you know, what it is that these people are actually doing and how they are engineering these viruses. And they, they give grants and it's it's ga yeah. dangerous gain of function research. And then they give you one medication that you have to take and everybody gets on board with it. And they're making fucking billions of dollars. Yes. And, and no one's talking about what he's saying. And he's saying it in a well-informed way. And he's expressing it to people like this is, this is the playbook they always use. And they just used it on everybody. Look, he's dealing with the same people we probably all are dealing with. And, and it's really time for us to really, um come up with a with a plan on how we're going to deal with this cuz it's just going to continue to happen. Yeah. It's just going to continue to happen, you know. I don't have all the answers. Um but I think we need to collectively start to you know not just give give a pass to people doing things like this. Um and you know, we got major outlets that's not Delivering the, the right message to the people. Not delivering the right message. Um, basically steering them the way that, you know, these super rich people want us to go. Um, and it's not cool. No, it's not. And I'm hoping people wake up enough to at least slow it down. Because 
these yeah. people are pushing in a very obvious and very specific direction. They want digital currency, centralized digital currency that they control, and they want to get everybody on a social credit score system. They'll probably connect it to some sort of a vaccine app. Or if you want to travel around, all they would need is another pandemic to try to push that shit through. And they're already talking about that. It's very spooky. Because when you look into the history of this, this lab and, and them funding it and this getting out and the, the way they responded to it, the whole thing is so scary because it was effective. It was effective and very, very financially effective. I mean, they made a lot of fucking money. Yeah. And if they could do something similar again and then clamp down more on people, that's what scares me. This, this talk of centralized digital currency, that's what they have in China. If, they, if you fuck up in China and you get a bad social credit score because you tweeted something they didn't like, what, now you can't buy a plane ticket. Now you can't buy a car. Yeah. Now, you, now you can't get a loan. Now you can't do something. You, you step the fucking line and people self-censor because mm -hmm. they don't want to be a part of that. Now they got you. Yep, they got you. Once you self-censor, yeah. got you where, where uh, they want you. Yeah, you know. we know that they were involved in Twitter. We know that the, the government was involved in silencing different voices. You know, they stopped that Hunter Biden laptop story from getting out before the election. It's just, it's so obviously dirty <laughs> shit. I did a record called Everything's Corrupt. And uh, it is when you really look around, yeah. man. It's like, where is the, where is the people that's doing the right thing? Yeah. You know, where they at? Have you thought about doing anything with politics? No, I would never. I would never do nothing with politics. Like, Does anybody try to pressure you? What you mean? Like, Cube, you should run for mayor. I tell them I'm already the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like, only thing I would do, I was, I said, uh, king me. You know, just only thing I would accept is. They turn you into a king? Turn me into a king. Like, <laughs> president, I mean, politician, begging ass politician. Mm. Uh, powerless puppet. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Oh no! You know, I, I talked to one guy who actually spends the money that the government uh, allocates. So, you know, that Kranger say this industry is going to get this many billions. Um, it's up to him to say where that money goes. And I'm like, well, how often do you talk to people at Congress? He said, never. He said, hey, they can't even get me on the phone. I'm like, what? He's like, yep. He said, these people can't even get me on the phone, man. I don't listen to them. You know what I mean? I just tell them where the money got to go. Wow. So he yeah. gets to decide? You know, he's part of. The government that, you know, when, when yeah. they allocate the money, it goes to these different agencies and departments and and then they allocate where it goes. Um, they can't spend any of it, so they can't take it, but right. they can spend it. And then they can develop relationships with the people they give the money to. Yeah, so, um, so you know, the people in Congress are, to me, actually <laughs> powerless. They're just theater at the end of the day well the theater who also gets the inside trade yeah <laughs> that's the beautiful thing exactly i mean they know where that money's going yeah you know what i mean they might not be able to touch it but they can be on the other end to make sure yeah. they you know their, their investments are carved out and they make a pretty penny off of it well not only that they do it openly in front of everybody and it's not illegal and every no. time people call to to ban it they were like nancy pelosi's like what no no we are. we're not gonna do that <laughs> why would we do that yeah the exactly. lady's worth 200 million dollars she makes 200 grand a year yeah right <laughs> she's better at stock trading than warren buffett and george soros yeah why wouldn't she be <laughs> she know where all the body i mean she know where, where everything is gonna hit it's you crazy. know what, what's going to hit, when it's going to hit, yeah. and how much it's going to hit for. And unless that's illegal, fuck you. Like, like fuck, fuck your whole system. Exactly, because, yeah. you know, um, it's easy to, you know, it's easy to corrupt these people. You know what I mean? It's, it's all money. Did you ever think you would have to think about it so much, though? Like, I, I didn't think about this so much, like, 10, 15 years ago. Um... Well, I always had my kind of 
you know, ever since, you know, people like Tipper Gore come after you, oh, yeah. you pay attention to where the shots are being fired, you know. So before then, just a little, you know, I was sitting, my, my pops would look at the news and yell at the screen. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean that's how, it, that's how I know what was bullshit and what was real, you know, because, and then, you know, I, I started doing my thing and then like the law the fbi you know all these agencies started to come down on us really scared the shit out out the record company because we wasn't we could care less like we was like <laughs> the day we got the fbi letter <clears throat> what was the fbi letter we got an fbi letter uh they sent the letter to priority records saying they one guy was like i'm you know part of this department of the FBI and we're very concerned with this record called Straight Out of Compton. Uh, you guys got a song on there called Fuck the Police and we think <laughs> this song could encourage um, you know, uh, people to go against law enforcement and blah blah this and blah blah that and um basically, you know, we'd like it if you guys took it off the shelf, you know what I'm saying? To that tip. So you know, they call us up there. You know, they panicking. And I, we don't know why they want us to come. they just like, man, you got to come up here. We got to talk to you. We get up there and it's like, pull out this letter, FBI. And we're like, he's like, man, do you know what this is? He's fucking agent. He, uh, he, he sent me this letter and, you know, they was all like nervous and shit. And we're looking like a letter. That's all you get. They not gonna come in here and try to fuck with us. Like they not gonna, you know what I mean? Arrest us, cuff us, rough us up, none of that. And we're like, y'all scared over a fucking letter? Come back, come back to South Central with us. You know what I mean? Deal with the sheriffs down there. You know what I mean? They do way more than give you a letter. So we felt that it was like, you know, easy was like. We're gonna be big as fuck after this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and 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 so, but but the guys at the record company, this was the first time they ever dealt with like pushback. First time the government probably even knew they existed. So they were freaked out. And we uh we were like, okay, we was looking for them to raid our houses and shit, like, damn, because we we done seen the battle ram, we done seen them run up in people's houses on dope charges, whatever, you know, especially in the late 80s, early 90s, that's like they got a kick out of just running up in people's houses and shit. So um, we were, like, looking for that to come for the in the next, you know, next few weeks. We was looking like, oh, they about to hit us. And it never happened. So we was like, what's the what's the issue? What's the problem? Why so it was just so that scared? letter and that was it? It was just that letter. And then we made the letter public. And they kind of just backed off and shit. Uh, and then it was, became this big story of, you know, the FBI hates this group. I think we was on the cover, like, one of those, you know, New York magazines. And it was like, the FBI hates this group. Yeah, look at this. Yeah, the FBI wow. hates this band. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Easy was right. Yeah, he was. That's the letter. Wow. Look at that. A song recorded by the rap group NWA on their album entitled Straight Outta Compton encourages violence and disrespect for law enforcement officer and has been brought to my attention. I understand your company recorded and distributed this album, and I am writing to share my thoughts and concerns with you. Advocating violence and assault is wrong, and we in the law enforcement community take the exception to such action. Violent crimes, a major problem in our country, reached an unprecedented high in 1988. Seventy-eight law enforcement officers were feloniously slain in the <laughs> feloniously <laughs> slain the line of duty during 1988. Four more in 1987. Uh, law enforcement officers dedicate their lives to protection of our citizens. And recordings such as the one from NWA are both discouraging and degrading to these brave, dedicated officers. Music plays a significant role in society, and I'd want you to be aware of the FBI's position relative to this song and its message. I believe my reviews reflect the opinion of the entire law enforcement community. 
Huh. Yeah. Never met this dude? Nah. Nah, never. Interesting. Yeah. 1988. It was a different world. And that was the first. That was like the, the first moment of that where, the, you know, we had heard that like the government and politicians were concerned about rap music. Without a doubt. Um, and then it just... No, they didn't come after me, but all these other different agencies were starting to hit us up. And, you know, they were going, they start going after Ice-T, you know, a little bit. Because uh -huh. he, he, Body Count did a song called Cop Killer. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a time when we grew up real fast. We had to understand that, you know, this is bigger than hip-hop. Um, and we got to. We got to stand up for what we know is true and right. It's like we're not making shit up, you know. <laughs> Go down, you know. Um, <clears throat> I've seen guys tell cops, you know what I mean, it's like, take off that gun, take off that badge, and we can, we can knuckle it up in the streets and do it like men. And uh, so, you know, we knew that sentiment was out there where people was really like, yo, um, if you're not going, if you're going to act like a thug, you know what I'm saying, let's thug it out. You know what I'm saying, or you're going to act like an officer, then we'll, 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 you know, um, you know, we'll respect your authority. You see what I mean? Yeah. So, it was a lot of cops that we respected that came through, that and they would treat us like, you know, real humans. You know, not like, you know, su suspects. You know what I mean? You don't want nobody come through just treating you like a suspect. You ain't out here doing nothing. These dudes, uh, so we knew some dudes that would come through and talk to us, tell us, you know, y'all need to watch out, be careful, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, do anybody know something that happened around the corner and all these little stuff? And we like, nah, nah, nah. But they was respectful, and, and we respected their authority. Then there was others that would come through, you know, look at you crazy, uh, harass you, you know. We was kids on the bikes. We saw one day they came. We like eight, nine years old, man. We on our bikes, got our bikes laid down. We made a ramp. We all kicking on the grass, resting, looking at our bikes like they're fucking motorcycles and shit. Like you know, and um, man, sheriffs hit the, hit the corner, came all up on the grass, and like get against the car, all that you know bullshit. For and we kids, they know we kids sitting on the bikes, man. What? What you think we did? You know what I'm saying? Like rolled on somebody's grass. <laughs> you know what I mean, what do you, what you think we out here doing? Yeah, yeah. So, what was it like when the album came out? Like interacting with cops. Most of them was cool, actually. Some most of them, it. most of them said they listened to the yeah. song. <laughs> um, in the movie, we get ran out of Detroit. Like they ran us off stage because we sung the song. A lot of undercover police, you know, throwing M80s and shit on the stage. Really? Yeah. So we thought they were shooting at us. So we run off. They catch us. They round us up. And, you know, they, like, thought you was going to come to Detroit, right, talking that cop. I mean, that uh, fuck the police shit. And can't come through Detroit talking that. And we should run y'all to jail, you know what I mean? We should lock y'all up and blah, blah, blah. And we, like, listening, we listening. And he said, um, but if y'all got a couple of pictures, y'all got a couple of 8x10s, y'all sign it for my daughter, <laughs> we ain't going to have no problems. So, you know, we was pissed, but we was like, man, Easy was like, get them T-shirts, get them everything they need. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And so, you know, we signed the shit, you know, reluctantly. You know, But the concert's over. Con yeah, they, they, they turned the concert out. Yeah. I mean, they they ran us off stage after three songs. And they got pictures. And then they got pictures, and they got autographs for their daughters, and they let us go. They just said, you can't come to Detroit with that bullshit. Wow. So it was only Detroit? That was the only place that fucked Cincinnati, like that? they ran us off. Really? Man, they would they would, they would would uh, have us. They would they, Before every concert, the a sergeant or a captain or somebody would come in with a city ordinance of what was obscene in their city, in their town, and what could be said on stage and what couldn't be said. And if you say any of this or do any of this, we will arrest you after your performance. Wow. Um, like what words? 
I mean, fuck, motherfuck. Really? Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, it's it was like the like, 1950s again. Yeah, it was like on that tip. Um, wow. And This is 88? He, around then? Yeah, 88, 89. Wow. And we hit the stage. We like, man, we would tell the audience. You know what these motherfuckers told us backstage? <laughs> They said we couldn't say fuck, we couldn't say shit, we couldn't say this, we couldn't say bitch. You know what I mean? And we're going to start this off with a bitch is a bitch. So. <laughs> a bitch is a bitch. You know, so um, we would do our shows. You know, sometimes they would just let us go. And then sometimes you would, like after the show, you'd have to look and see the look in, like the security in everybody's face. And you knew, okay, they on us. So m many a times... We, we we come off stage, but then we like switching jackets. Like people handing you jackets, handing you different shirts mm. and shit, so you can put them on and walk through the backstage. Because now cops was like, where 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 they at? You know, where, where those guys that was on stage? And um, in Cincinnati, I had to, I saw them coming. I saw them all like looking around, and I didn't have a chance to change my shit, so they was looking for me. And so uh, I hit the exit. I just, I went outside. I went outside the concert. And it was people, like, flowing in and out. And uh, it was like, Q, what you doing out here? I said, man, they looking for me. <laughs> He's like, I jumped in the car with them, like fans and shit. I just oh, jumped wow. in the car with them. They drove me across the bridge just to uh, Kansas City. I mean, uh, Kentucky is right across from Cincinnati. And it's like We're sitting there waiting for anybody to drive up nobody drove up and they end up driving me back to the hotel and then you got easy and dre where the fuck was you where'd you go man we all got citations and we got to come back here they <laughs> want us to fly back here to go to court and they couldn't catch they was looking for you they couldn't catch you i was like man i dip i dip <laughs> <laughs> and i'm gonna dip again next show <sighs> you know what i'm saying it was it was crazy um did just, they have to go back to they court? had to go back to court. Wow. Yeah, they had to go back to court and fight what, it. What happened? I don't remember because I ended up leaving the group. Oh, I ended wow. up leaving the group, so I don't really know what happened kind of after 89 with, with everybody. You know. Wow. What a wild time. It's crazy. Crazy. But fun. Like, we were living the time of our lives because we never knew we was going to be this popular throughout the country. We thought... The records that we did were just local. You know, we was going to be, you know, hood stars. You know what I mean? Right there in our neighborhood, people was going to love us. But outside of Compton, South Central, Long Beach, Watts, we were like, you know, people, they not even going to know what we're talking about. Right. Little did we know that everybody was kind of going through the same things that we were going through. That's so wild. So what, like, what was it like when it blew up? I mean, that had to be for you to be a young guy in this, you know, hip hop just in general was relatively new. Yeah. And for it to blow up that big, that had to be a wild like change of your life. It was, you know, because you think, you think you're only gonna be an underground artist. Like, when, before we sold our records, records like ours would be in the section with like the the Red Fox records and the mm -hmm. Richard Pryor, the Eddie Murphy, the dirty, you know, you know, comedy, dirty comedy records. That's where you would find these dirty hip hop records. And there was a few, you know, um, it was a dude named um, uh, Blowfly. Blowfly would have songs called, he had a song, he got one, a song called Rap Dirty. And like those kind of songs would be in this section that nobody went to unless you just wanted to laugh or something. So we thought our records would end up there in that bin. And it just it just blew up. MTV banned our straight out of Compton video and that blew the group up because <laughs> people wanted to know why did they do something that even MTV was scared to show. And so we went from thinking we were going to be in that little bin to they putting us in the front of the record store and promoting that you can get straight out of Compton here. Wow. And so it just took us from, you know, that 
back of the store stuff to prime real estate. How yeah. many records did Straight Outta Compton sell? Um, I don't know the exact end figure, but even that, while I was still in the group, we was like two million records, and then it was just growing. So by now, it's got to be up to at least four. Wow. Yeah. That had to be a fucking crazy experience to not think that that was ever going to happen. And then, yeah. boom. It was. Most you know, controversial band in America. We went from being straight locals to, like, being everywhere. Matter of fact, I I went to school after I was in the group. Like, I was like, you know, I can't. I, I can't hang my hat on this. I'm not going to be able to live, you know what I mean, on dirty rap records. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can't play them on the radio. You know, only underground people are going to hear it. So I went off to a trade school, Phoenix, Arizona, called uh, Phoenix Institute of Technology. What would you go to learn? Architectural drafting. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I took drafting in school, and I dug it, and... Send some pamphlet in the mail. You know, if you want more information, fill this out. A little postcard. I filled it out. I fucking showed up to my house and it was in there talking to my mother and father. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, you're going to school. What? I got a show. I got a. I... No, you're going to school. I'm like, damn. Damn. But how long was that for? A year. Wow. Yep. Yep. Fall of fall of eighty seven to the um fall of eighty eight. Wow. So you got out of trade school and then the album blows up. That, I mean we got out of trade school and then we was working on Easy solo album. Easy does it, his solo album came out right before NWA. And mm. that you know, that blew him up and we were along for the ride, so when the NWA record came and he was part of the NWA group. It just put a spotlight on on the group, and then the record was crazy. So, just took it to the next level. What was your earliest influences in hip hop? Um, Curtis Blow, Run DMC, um, Sugar Hill Gang, um, Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, Biz Marquis, uh, Salt and Pepper. You know, like the greats. All the greats. Uh, Beastie Boys, LL Cool J for sure. You know, we loved LL. Like, LL was the man always. And so, do you, when was the first time you actually performed? How old were you? Um, I was probably 15. Is that a local thing? Yeah, well, you know, we would do rap battles. So we would go up to people's school and find out, you know, everybody didn't rap. Like like now, everybody raps. But back then, it was like a niche group. So we was we had honed our skills, so we would go up to different high schools and hop the fence and at nutrition and shit and, like, find a spot and battle. You know what I mean? So it was it was fun. I was like... It was like a, a karate master looking for a spar. <laughs> you know, we walking around. It's like, who go to that school? Can they, who rap over there? Who over here? Who? It's like, man, some dudes at my school, man, they can bust, man. Y'all should come up here. You know, I was trying to set it up for Friday. Y'all come up here Friday, hit the fence. You know, we bust, and then y'all got to get out before, you know what I mean, the counselors come. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So we'd find ourselves going from different high schools. We would ditch our own school to go up to different schools and, and rap against people. But um, first time I really hit the stage, we uh, we did this contest called the Best Rappers of the West Contest. And um, we entered our song, and man, we, we made it all the way to the finals. They did the finals at the Olympic Auditorium in L.A. Uh, that's where they used to do all the old wrestling matches and fights. Um, so... They used to do roller derby there, too, um, Thunderbirds. And so we there, we performed. Dre came. You know, Dre was in the world-class wrecking crew, DJ crew, you know. So everybody there, family, friends. And they messed up our tape. Like, 
you know, our, our, our music was instrumental, but it was cassette. And when they hit it, it was in the wrong spot. They didn't rewind it. So we got, it was off cue and then they had to rewind it and then start over. The thrill was gone. We lost, we lost, we came in second place. And so that was my first taste of, you know, hitting the stage. You knew that's what you wanted to do? I loved it. You know, I had a great time. Yeah, I did. And hanging with Dre more and more, you know, he saw us that night. He knew we had got kind of robbed a little bit. And he was like, we'll let you, we'll let y'all perform at Dudo's, which is the club he DJed in Compton. It's right there on Central Bull- Central Avenue. And um, we went down there, you know, it's, it's a party, f- I mean, full of bloods. It's like, Full of Compton Bloods, Pyrus, all through this place. This is right in their neighborhood. And Dre is like, y'all better be good. <laughs> y'all better be good, man. These do- I don't know what they're going to do. They might throw shit at you, you know. Might want to fuck you up. Y'all better be good. And that's all he kept saying. So we were like, damn, we got to think of something clever. We got to be good. We got to be good. So we started doing parody raps. We would take the hit song and do a dirty version of it. Roxanne, Roxanne was the hit song that was out, UTFO. And we we made a song called Diane, Diane. And it was a dirty version of it. And it went crazy. It went crazy. So we knew, like, oh, damn, this this is a style. Like, we can, we can do our own raps hardcore like this. We don't have oh. to... We don't, we don't have to... Um, Try to be, you know, fat boys. We don't try to have to try to be. Uh, Mainstream. Yeah, these we can just give it to them raw how they want it. Talk about the neighborhood, you know. Yeah, that's what we start doing. So that's interesting. Like that. So that sort of led to the way the band became doing that show. Yeah, yeah, and, and doing that show, we see. I wasn't in NWI. I had my own group. So we start working with Easy and NWA is actually an all star group. It's it's easy kind of plucking different people from different groups, putting them together and saying, We're gonna make we gonna huddle up and make these dirty records. And then after we finish, y'all can go back and make y'all clean little records. That's kinda how NWA was formed. Wow. Yeah, so they grabbed Dre and Yella from Wrecking Crew. They grabbed me. I was in a group called Stereo Crew. We changed our name to CIA. Criminals in action, but Lonzo made us call ourselves Crew in action because he was like, nobody going to buy a record that's like criminals. You know, so, <laughs> so, so, and then you had Easy, you know what I mean? So we formed NWA. Ren come, came later. When I went to school, that's when Ren came, MC Ren. So... Yeah, and then what happened is we do the record, it blow up, and everybody say, uh, tell the groups, hey, man, <laughs> this shit is popping. In no way in the world we all going back to being nobody in, in our groups. You know what I mean? We got to yeah. run with this, and it just, I'm still running with it. You were always known for your lyrics. You're a great writer. Like, Thank if you... Did you always have that ability? Do you, are you, wait, did you write before you wrote lyrics? Yeah. But, you know, what I what I did when I was young, you know, the teachers would always ask, like, well, okay, what you do over summer vacation? What would you do? Write, write down what you guys do. So mine would be thorough. You know, I, w- I would be able to really explain everything that I did and – they were really impressed. My teachers were impressed that I could remember all that and put it in a c- comprehensive form where they can read, you know, my whole summer, really. And so by getting those kind of, you know, extra credit for being good or, you know, teacher hang your stuff up there, you know, you're like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Same with art. You know, and I actually, they they had me do a speech during my sixth grade graduation. Like, they asked me, would you go up there and address the 
graduation class. So, you know, the writing, that speech, these things, I knew, okay, I could I could put words together and I could speak them in front of a crowd and it wasn't a nightmare. So when it was time to rap and time to rhyme, which was a couple years later when I turned 14, then I was able to put it together and feel like, okay, I, I know how to write and I know how to rap. So jump in front of the crowd and get busy. That's amazing. That's, a, that's, that's so interesting that that's the genesis of your writing because it makes sense. Because, like, your writing was always so thorough and well thought out, you know. And when you went solo, that was, like, very evident. It was very evident. Like, this is great fucking writing. Like, the that the, the lyrics back then, like, that's my favorite era yeah. of hip-hop. Yeah. Is like, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Like, in mm -hmm. the East Coast, like, Cool Mo D. Yeah. 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 Yeah, p prolific. Yeah. And um, set the bar. You know, those guys started to set the bar higher mm -hmm. and higher and you know you had to keep up to even get attention so yeah you know those early pioneers of hip-hop even ll was you know mm -hmm. amazing lyricist wordsmith you know the original rock the bells he's another guy that's done everything yeah and he's uh movies I, TV. I, I call him you know the hip-hop lebron you know he He'd been doing this since he was 15 yeah. at, at the highest level and never came down. You know yeah. what I mean? So It still looks great. Yeah. Still, you know, looks like a um, superstar. Yeah. So it's cool, you know, to find, you know, to be friends with these guys that uh, that I looked up to so much as a youngster. That was a, there was a weird time. The, the East Coast versus West Coast shit it was yeah. very weird. Yeah. It was... Um, you know, people equated to Tupac and Shug. I mean, and, and Bad Boy and Death Row, but it was actually bubbling before that. It was to me an industry thing in a way. Like New York had the throne for so long, and here go well at least a decade or more, and here comes these West Coast rappers. You know, kind of taking attention away and so the 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 industry people it started to bubble up with them that yo we're doing real hip-hop they're just doing gangster records you know and so that started to to kind of get into the artists you know what i mean that 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 sentiment started to poison the artists and an artist named tim dog did a song called Fuck Compton, like, out of nowhere. We was like, damn, we we like New York. Why y'all, you know, why why he take a shot? And nobody really rebutted him. Like, you know, they kind of let it slide. And then more and more artists start taking shots here and there. And, and then the thing with... Bad Boy and Death Row, it kind of just took it over the top. It just made it, because they were the hottest labels. You had the hottest label on the East Coast battling with the hottest label on the West Coast. So that made that undercurrent of animosity that was growing blow all the way up and look like it was a feud. Mm. Yeah. How did that ever get resolved? I think when... When uh, Tupac got killed and then Biggie was murdered shortly after, people realized this is a dead-end road. Like, people stopped listening, really, to East Coast and West Coast at that time. And that's how the immersion of the South came. Mm. You know, the South was there bubbling. They was doing their thing. They had groups that were, that was making a dent, but... At one point, all the hip hop fans were so fed up with the East Coast, West Coast beef that they said, you know, we're just gonna pay attention to what the South is doing. You guys gotta heal your wounds and come back. Mm. And so that's the emergence of the South and, you know, all the groups that came out. Back then, were you, were you touring on the East Coast? Yeah. 
So what yeah. was it like when you were touring on the East Coast in the middle of all that shit? Um, I mean, it was always love. You know, I mean, some fans took sides, but most most of it was, you know, industry stuff, and they were kind of caught in the middle. So, you know, I did a I did a record called you know Bow Down with the West Side Connection, which we addressed a lot of the beef because we felt like most of the industry was in New York at the time. So we felt like if we didn't stand up for ourselves in some way, shape, or form, what we accomplished the last decade would be erased and eroded and dismissed, discredited. And we wouldn't, we would be played out. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? We wouldn't have longevity. Right. So, you know, there was, you know, back and forths. But at the end of the day, um, you know, Tupac being killed, Biggie being killed, was just a wake-up call for the whole industry. That's sad that that's how the, that's how the wake-up call had to go. It's crazy. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, that was, I, re I remember I was uh, on news radio, on the set of news radio, when someone told me Tupac got killed. And I remember thinking, how is that possible? How is that yeah. real? I, I, um... Yeah, I just, you know, it was a new day. Like, it's like, oh, we, we're in a new era where celebrity means nothing. You know, celebrity means nothing. Anybody can get it. Yeah. So it's damn near like we back where we started from, back in the hood, you know, trying yeah. not to get it. And here you're a celebrity and you can still get it. How dangerous did that feel to you back then? Um... You know, no more dangerous than it feels when any of people, you know, any person I know gets shot. You know, it feels like, you know, damn, you know, this never ends. Um, I don't remember taking any more precaution than I usually would. Um, but I knew people, you know, some dudes was getting bulletproof trucks and shit and bulletproof vans and all this stuff i was like nah i ain't going to that extent it's just a crazy time in music history too because you know there'd never been like rock bands that were feuding with each other to the point where you were worried about people getting murdered no not that i know of um you know rock bands do feud they usually don't do diss records either. Right, right. <laughs> you know, they just feud or they have subliminal subliminal disses. It's never like... Yeah, the diss record straight. thing was wild. That was yeah. really the first time artists ever went after each other like that. Yeah. it's uh, But, you know, it's it's like... It's like sparring. It's like battling. It's like, you know, it's part of the game. So it's welcomed in a way. Um, you know, you... You spar, you practice, you know how to fight, and then somebody get in your face and challenge you. Like, okay, this is what we do. Let's rumble. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like you grow up battling. You know, you got your raps. You say your cocky shit. You know what I mean? You, and somebody want to, you know, put it on wax and battle. Like, we can battle on wax any day. You know what I'm saying? So let's go for it. When did it feel like for you all that shit sort of like went away? Like the feud stuff, the every, when did it seem like it was just back to just making music? Um for some reason I think um like 9/11, like that tragedy of 9/11, for some reason like it seemed like from then the feud stopped and mm people kind of reassessed and reorganized their thought process when it comes to that. Like they, it was like, th that's when it seemed like a ceasefire just was the best thing to do. Mm. Cause you know, the, the, like the country went through a crazy shakeup. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's a trip, you know, you had groups like, Rocking the red, white, and blue, and he was like mm -hmm. into, 
you know, um, you know, patriotism and really uh, into, you know, uh oh, you know, we got other forces out there that's trying to take down New York City. You know, what I mean, we can't can't be hating on right on New York after that. Like we all gotta band together. That was the sentiment. It's crazy that sometimes it takes something like that, like a, a national tragedy to wake people up to what's really important. Yeah, major shakeup. So how the fuck did you go from NWA, your solo career, and then movies, and then family movies? Like, was there, was there like a resistance for that? People like, did you listen to his old shit? Was, was there... <laughs> 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 oh, you know, shit. I mean, because people uh, were taking their kids to see those movies, and then yeah. those kids became Ice Cube fans, and then they yeah. go into your old shit, and like, wow. Yeah, I mean, it's a great, um, it's kind of like, you know, they're caught in the Ice Cube vortex in a way, you know mm. what I'm saying? Because um, here's how it happened. Like, I'm, I'm in the NWA, I go solo. I'm just trying to be the best rapper in the world. That's all I'm concerned about. And I meet this kid, John Singleton, who's an intern. I meet him at the Arsenio Hall show. He's an intern there. I'm there to talk to Arsenio to say, dude, you had two live crew on. Why don't you have NWA on? So never had that conversation with Arsenio because John Singleton is talking my ear off. And he's like, I'm a junior at USC, I'm going to put you in a movie. I'm like, dude, what? <laughs> I'm not an actor. You know what I mean? I, I thought you had to go to Juilliard for 18 years to be an actor. So I'm like, what? What you talking about, man? No. And then he pursued me two years, dude. Two years. He And then he finally said, yo, um, I got the movie. You know, we're going to do it. And And so that was Boys in the Hood. So he discovered me. That's how I got into movies. And when we doing that movie, he's saying, when you going to write a movie? Like, what? Dude, what are you talking about? Why you keep hitting me with this stuff that I don't do? He said, man, you can write a song like that. You can write a movie like that. So I'm like, okay. I go by a computer that same day. And Final Draft, which is a script writing, and I start writing a script. Like, don't know one thing about writing a script. Just start writing one. And it, it was terrible, but he helped me. He just kept telling me, keep writing, keep more pages. Just keep going till you finish it. And um, long story short, I end up a few years later writing Friday. Okay, Friday, 1995, comes out. Big cult classic. Um, so as I, as the years go on, I got these little kids coming to me doing all these cuss lines from Friday. <laughs> I'm like, what your little ass doing watching Friday? You know? So, so I did, I did another movie called Barbershop. Now that's an already comedy Friday. So I do Barbershop. It's good reaction. People love it. It's PG-13. So the movie is bigger because it it's, appeals to a bigger audience. Um, so I'm like, damn, we was able to work it at rated R. We able to work it at PG-13. What if I did a PG movie? Because I still got little kids coming to me talking about, you got knocked the fuck out. And they, <laughs> seven. <laughs> like, I need to do something for your little seven-year-old ass so you don't have to go watch Friday. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. You should be watching Friday when you get about 11, 12, not seven. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I was with Revolution, uh, Joe Rolfe over at Revolution, and he was like, yo, we got this movie that Adam Sandler was going to do, but he can't do it. Will you take a look at it? And I said, yeah, I'll take a look at it. And it was, are we, are we there yet? I'm like, oh, this is a kid's movie. You know, he's like, yeah. I said, okay, I, I think I can, you know, tailor make it where it fits me. 
But yeah, let's give it a try. And we do it. And of course, everybody go ape shit. Like, Cube, you gangster. What you doing these kids' movies for? What's wrong with you? What the hell's going on, man? You don't got soft. All this stuff they was talking, right? So, movie comes out, and kids like lose their mind. They love the movie. So now, this is the vortex, right? They come in, they love Are We There Yet? Five, six, seven, eight. <clears throat> By the time they get 10 or 11, somebody done showed them Barbershop or maybe Friday. So they, they, they love me from Are We There Yet? Now they love me from Friday. And then somebody says, listen to this. And hands them my music when they get about 15, 14. <laughs> and they <laughs> say... I love this guy. And I got fans all ages who love Ice Cube because they've been like walked up from Are We There Yet to Barbershop to Friday to my music, which is a whole different animal. This, I don't and, think there's anybody else like that that has that varied of a career. Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. But I don't it, it's so. it's pretty cool and dynamic, you know. I know I met your daughter; she's twenty seven. Yeah, and first thing she was exposed to was "Are yeah. We There Yet?" You yeah, know, she's a fan. You know what I'm saying? So that movie was a way to stay connected to the younger generation always, without the parents saying, "Do you know who this is?" Right. This is Ice Cube. He used to be blah 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 and blah blah blah. Now the kids know who I am before the parents even have to point it out. Yeah. So it's been a great thing for my career as far as longevity and gaining new fans without necessarily having to have a, a new hit record. Right, right, right. Well, you have a gi giant library of content. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's cool because, you know, there's always going to be kids always going to be new kids. It's always going to be something for parents to try to shove in front of them to mm -hmm. watch, to take yeah. their time. And Are We There Yet is a cool option. You know what I'm saying? So, And then we did Are We Done Yet? And, you know, people are asking me, when are you going to do the next one? And I'm like, y'all want a third one? Okay, let's think about it. Are you going to do a third one? We'll see. We got to talk to Joe and Revolution and, you know, get it right. When I found out that you wrote Friday... I was like, that's insane. That's incredible. Yeah, me and me and DJ Pooh. That's a funny fucking movie. Yeah. Yeah, it is, you know. I mean, DJ Pooh, he's one of those he's like one of those undercover geniuses that been in he been involved in a lot of hip hop. I mean, he he helped LL do going back to Cali. You know wow. what I mean? Like he been around f forever and we we're all fans of Pooh. You know what I'm saying? And Pooh um, is funny. He technical. He He's the one who who got Rockstar to do the Grand Theft, Autos, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. That whole, you know, like take it from Miami and put it in L.A. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Take it from the Miami dope culture to the L.A. gang culture. So... He's the one who's behind the scenes with stuff like that, and he helped me write Friday. He produced uh, It Was a Good Day, the song. Um, so whenever we together, it's just magic. And uh, wow. we wrote Friday f because we were watching uh, In Living Color, uh, and we loved Hollywood Shuffle by Robert Townsend. And uh, we was like, Let's write a let's write a movie about the neighborhood, like, because everything that was coming out was depressing, you know. It was, mm. it was colors, boys in the hood, right. menace to society, right. South Central. It was like, yo, this is a hell zone, and we was like, I didn't. Did you remember it like that, or don't we laugh around here all the time? Like, yeah. let's let's show how it really is for us around here, mm. and so. That's how Friday kind of germinated and became like, yo, we're going to show our version of what, how we have fun in South Central. And it's an all-time classic. 
Yeah, it's it's uh it's a movie that I get commented on more than any other. Like people quote it, love it. Yeah. The the characters are iconic. Um uh, people dress up. Like, when you know you got a, a line like you got knocked the fuck out that gets repeated for decades. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I knew I knew it was one of those lines because I had never heard it in a movie before <laughs> when somebody got knocked out. And I'm like, yeah, this is what he going to say when he jump over him and look down on him. Like, you got knocked the fuck out. How many times have you seen that on a world? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many times have you seen that on world star hip hop now, though? All the time. It's just Forever. like everybody yells. Yeah. If someone goes down, it's automatic. It's automatic. Yeah. You know, all you know, that's as as an artist, that's all you want is to have a couple classics mm. that people remember you for, you know, when you eighty in a cafe, you know, drinking coffee, somebody run up and be like, Yo, Craig, what's up? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's that's all you want. That's amazing. What what do you in like you could do whatever the fuck you want now. What do you enjoy doing most? Um creating, you know, on all levels. Like that's what get my juices going is being in the lab, the creative process, uh whether it's music, um movies, uh you know, TV, you know, documentaries or you know, sports. It's being it's being creative. It's it's being part of the mix. Um, when I go on, on movies and I'm just an actor, you know, I'll be like, oh, "Damn, this yeah. is so boring." Yeah, just sitting around waiting to act. You know, yeah. uh, I like to be in the producers' meetings. I like to know what's going on, what's on the set. Did we, did we get that stunt? Is you know, we're gonna still do that stunt at three o'clock? You know, I just need to be yeah. part of the mix to stay you know, motivated and interested, you yeah. know what I mean? But if I'm just a piece of the puzzle and kind of sitting off to the side waiting to be used like a tool like, um, yeah. it's not as cool for me. Uh, understandable. Yeah. Why would it be? And you don't have yeah. to do that anymore. Yeah. You know, so I want to I wanna be in the mix. You know, I want to be in the kitchen cooking it. I don't just want to sit down and eat it. No matter what it is. No matter what it is. If I'm going to be a part of it, I got to be in the kitchen. I can't just play a play a look. I've acted in movies, you know. I did two, Twenty One Jump Street. I did uh, Three Kings, you know, where I'm just an actor, and I'm I'm fine with that. You know, don't think okay, we can't hire Q because he just want to produce. But but I like to produce, and I think I add a lot to to the movies that I produce. And the movies I produce, you can watch over and over and over again. And never get tired. Yeah, no, it's a, you've had an amazing career. So when you just decided, you just do, you, you kind of just do whatever you're interested in now. Like, whatever you feel like pursuing. Yeah. That's a beautiful freedom. It is. Because, you know, I'm not playing the game no more. Like, I don't play the radio game. Like, how many spins did I get on that song? How many spins? I look at Ice Cube fans like clientele. I just want to serve them, give them what they like, give them what they love, and go back to the lab. I'm not I'm not worried about charts and all these measuring sticks on if you're good or not or is your work good, you know, views or whatever. I'm into doing dope shit that I feel and giving it to the people that want it. That's beautiful. It's great for artists. It's a beautiful life. It's, it's pretty, um, I'm pretty blessed in that aspect. Because I know guys and I know people who are bigger than me on, on major labels with, and they're miserable because they, they're so scheduled and structured and mm -hmm. they feel obligated because, you know, this and that going on and, and, I don't want to feel obligated when I'm making music to the people who's spending money. I want to make the music I feel, and if you like it, spend money on it. Well, you have a very wise philosophy on how to live your life. 
because like just the way you just like talking about rich people there's a lot of rich people that are miserable as fuck you yes. don't want to be rich you want to be happy yes you'd rather be less rich and more happy without a doubt um like whatever it is you know whatever it is man it's more important to be happy doing it yeah and i notice when you're happy doing things and when you when you love what you do and when you um put your all into it you know the money comes when you focus on the money and you're doing things to get the money you're never happy doing it or rarely happy doing it and at the end of the day you wish you could have got more money so yeah you're not even happy with what you would pay it also doesn't resonate with people the same way it resonates with people when you do what you love when you do what you love and it comes out especially when when you're talking about music yeah you do what you love people get it they feel it they feel it from the work yeah and if you're mm. just doing it because you're hoping it's going to be successful people feel that too yeah or just doing what you think is a hit mm -hmm. that's the worst thing uh the worst thing an artist can do is to go try to make a hit mm. you got to make a good song Damn if it's a hit. Yeah. A good song is a good song, whether it's played a thousand times or once. You know, that's what you focus on, making good music. And whether it's a hit or not, that's, you know, that's in the stars, you know. Where, where do you think you got this wisdom to look at things so objectively and clearly? Um, I, I think... You know, when I look at how I grew up, like my pops is an independent man, independent thinker. He's not part of any club or any organization or any fraternity or any gang or any. It's no man that can come and tell him what to do unless he's at work. <laughs> so um, I like that. And. I saw him stand on his own two feet, you know, from he, he, he moved to L.A. when he was 19 years old from Louisiana. And so he's been a man that handled his business from day one. So um, I think he's the foundation of, of how I view things um, and and living and, and being young, thrown into the fire. You know, it seemed like every time I look up, there's something that uh, that needs my focus and attention that's trying to take down what I've built. So I, um, I'm i always paying attention, you know. I never, I never, um, I, I never go in something blind. And, I, you know, I try to understand all the angles before I make a decision. That's very fortunate you had a father like that. I am. You know, I, I thank him all the time for just hanging around. You know, the statistics are what they are. Mm. Um, and as men, we got to we gotta raise our kids, you know what I mean? We got to be there. Um, and as much as we can. Is, and and um, it makes a difference. It makes a difference with the person that you're raising and the person that you're sending out into the world. You know, you want to give you want to give your family stability and fathers can do a lot of that. They can do a lot of that. Yeah. It's a uh, it's got to feel great for you to see your son taken off like this. Yeah. You know, it, like with the wisdom that you got from your father that your son is obviously he's acquired that as well. Mm -hmm. They it, works hard. It's great, man. You know, all you want to do is you want your kids to step up in the moment of truth. You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. want them to do what it takes at the time that it's mandatory or, the, you know, the situation arise that they can step up. Even if it's taking out the trash. Like, you tell your kid, hey, you know, take out the trash. When I, when I get back, I want this done and when you get back and it's done you feel better as a parent yeah you know what i mean you feel like okay they stepped up 
when they needed to, when I asked them to. And make you feel good that you, you know, got people that that you're sending out in the world that are dependable and responsible and not trying to fuck over nobody. Yeah. Fuck yeah. No, that's that's one of the greatest accomplishments you can make as a human being. You you made the world better by raising better people. Yeah. Raise good people and um you know, that's 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 the number one job of a parent, I believe, is yeah. to raise a good person because def- the world don't need another asshole. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> we don't need another one. Man. We got plenty. Yeah, we got plenty. We're all full. Yeah. For show show. But it's also great that you, you, you set a standard with uh, maybe people that don't even have a father figure, that you set a standard with your words, the way you talk about things and address things and think about things, and you're so thorough that you, you set a standard with other young kids that admire you too, which is beautiful. That's good. You know, that's great. Uh, you know, and I'm I'm blessed to be in a position to do that. Um, I want to do that. You know, if you, you know, I hope I'm a good example on. You know, I have fun with the music and the entertainment and this and that, but you know, I, I want to be a solid person. You know, what I mean that. Say what I mean, mean what I say, and do what I say, and um, you know. All you got is your balls and your word, man. That's it. Tony Montana. That's all you got. <laughs> That's all you got. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you've you've done it, and you've done it in an amazing way. You you set a, a, a great standard. Appreciate it, man. Um, you have too. You know you you are a great um, communicator. You know what I mean. And people need to hear somebody with courage speak for the people when others are so scared to you know some of the things that that you said um today you know a lot of people would be scared to even bring that stuff up man well so it's we what you it. said if you can you should when you got the yeah. mic use yeah. it yeah and i can so i do <laughs> yeah when you got the mic use it someone has to this is a, this is a wild ass fucking time it is man and we need we need people to step up that we trust. You know, we we don't need no more people to let us down that we b- believe in, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, listen, brother, I appreciate you very much. It was an honor to have you in here. I've been a giant fan since the 80s, which is crazy. And uh I just uh I appreciate everything you do, man. Appreciate you too, man. You know, you're great at what you do. Um you got me into you got me into uh, UFC. You gonna watch next weekend? Yeah, I'm gonna watch. Volkanovski, and, Yair I'm, Rodriguez. Woo! It, it's your it's your passion for the sport, your knowledge of the sport, your breakdown, your ability to to go back and say, you know, the origin of this move and the origin of this move really got me into the game. So you you know you're an uh, excellent communicator and. Uh, I appreciate you letting me on your show. My pleasure. It was an honor. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. All right. Bye, everybody.